Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. The economy is all over the news right now. Last week alone, we saw how a weak jobs report in the U.S. could wipe billions off stock markets around the world. The Federal Reserve is under pressure to cut rates and avoid a recession before it's too late. And in the middle of all this economic drama... Hello, Philadelphia. I went to school in Philadelphia. Oh, it is good to be back in Pennsylvania. Well, there's an election. And all eyes are on a key group of states with economic concerns of their own. When it comes to Election Day in November, seven states are likely to be where the election will be decided. So we decided to take a look at the economy in those seven states. Sean Donnan is a senior writer at Bloomberg News. Arizona, Nevada, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, North Carolina, and Georgia. I think I got them all. So we're talking about 61 million people, about 17 percent of the U.S. population. But it's also an economy that, if you put it out in the world, would be huge, just slightly bigger than Japan and almost as big as Germany's. Sean calls this the battleground economy. Pollsters and pundits say that seven swing states could decide the presidential election in November. So the economic forces shaping the lives of voters in those states are important to understand. Both former President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris know how important it is to convince swing state voters that if they take office, they'll turn things around. You can see that reflected in who they chose for their running mates. Trump chose Ohio Senator J.D. Vance. And just last week, Harris tapped Minnesota Governor Tim Walz. While neither of them directly represent states in the group of seven that Sean mentioned, both picks are seen widely as an appeal to voters in Midwestern industrial states, places like Michigan and Pennsylvania. And when Sean and his colleagues looked at the economy in these places, they found that this battleground economy is showing some economic cracks. You know, a lot of economists have been miffed that uh, voters in polls after polls say that they are feeling grumpy about the economy when at a national level, the U.S. economy looks like it's in root health and in fact, in historically good shape. But it's when you dig down and you go to look at these state economies and you go down to the county level, even that things start to look a little bit different. It's a complicated picture. Arizona has, by some measures, enjoyed strong growth. But inflation and soaring housing costs have hit household budgets hard, much as they have in Nevada and North Carolina. Meanwhile, Georgia has benefited from new investments in electric vehicle plants, but it's also seen growth diluted by the swell of new residents. Today on the show, inside the battleground economy that could decide the 2024 presidential election, what Americans feel in those states about their economic prospects and how that could impact their vote. From Bloomberg's Washington Bureau, this is the Big Take DC podcast. I'm Saleya Mosin. Erie County, Pennsylvania, has about 270,000 residents. It's a purple county, a mix of red and blue, Republicans and Democrats. A swing county in a swing state. It is a place that Donald Trump won in 2016. Joe Biden won by 1,400 votes in 2020. It's also in the heart of what political wonks call the Blue Wall, states that Democrats have historically relied on for a clear path to the presidency. Some states within the Blue Wall, like Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, were once industrial hubs. And from 2019 to the end of 2023, their economies have experienced slower growth than non-battleground states. It's a change people like Phil Kerner have felt firsthand. He's a third-generation Erie manufacturer, known locally as the tool-and-die guy for the YouTube videos that he posts about production. If our plant shut down tomorrow, I'm not sure I'd find a job. Okay? 1995, I'm walking down the street with my toolbox, just wheeling it a block away, probably getting a raise and going right to work that afternoon. See? That's the way it used to be. Phil used to own his own shop, mostly building molds for consumer products and toys. But by the early 2000s, he says he was priced out. His biggest customers, like Fisher Price, took their business overseas. At the end there, I'd quote $18,000 on a mold, and I would be beat by China. They would come in at $3,500. My steel was going to cost more than that, just my materials, let alone the labor. So it was kind of heartbreaking. 
Erie County has for decades been dealing with this kind of typical Rust Belt deindustrialization, factories closing, you know, those dynamics that Donald Trump took advantage of in 2016 and that Joe Biden has sought to address by trying to bring manufacturing jobs back to the United States. Phil says President Biden's efforts haven't done much on the ground, at least not in ways that he can feel. He generally votes Republican and says that most of his co-workers at his plant support Trump. Gas was cheaper, he said, when Trump was president. Of course, those cheaper gas prices were before the pandemic, which, Sean says, hit places like Erie hard. Erie County is a place that's still lagging in its recovery. By the end of 2022, which is the most recent data we have available from the government, was still 3.2% smaller than it was going into the pandemic. That's not a good thing. You want economies to continue growing. And, and it hasn't seen major manufacturing investments in recent years. You still see fewer people working in factories there than did going into the pandemic. You also see the population has continued to decline. So it is a place that is in need of help. The federal government has tried to help, and Erie-based companies are investing money in the local economy. $1.2 billion revamping the downtown, a new food hall, plans for a boutique hotel. But when you get there and you start talking to people on the ground, they say, yes, we're seeing a new boulevard along the lakefront and some improvements in the downtown area, but we're not really feeling it. Then you hear the common complaints that you hear in a lot of other places about inflation, about grocery store prices, interest rates, housing costs. Sean, along with economists at Bloomberg Economics, found that this is happening in a lot of counties throughout swing states. They wanted to understand the numbers that make up this important battleground economy. It's something like $4.4 trillion in gross domestic product, which is how we measure the size of economies. In fact, it would be the third or fourth largest economy in the world. And within that subset of states, not all places are faring the way the rest of the U.S. is. President Biden often has talked about adding 800,000 manufacturing jobs in the United States since he came into office. And that's true. But in a place like Pennsylvania, they actually haven't added that many manufacturing jobs. Just for context, across the U.S., about 20 percent of the population lives in a county that hadn't recovered to its 2019 level of GDP by the end of 2022. In Pennsylvania, 40 percent of the population lives in those counties, most of which voted for Donald Trump in 2020. So the lived experience at the local level is very different from what you're seeing nationally. And it's not just the old industrial towns like Erie that are struggling. Sean also looked at Washoe County, Nevada. Growth in the Reno area has drawn more than 76,000 new residents since 2010 and transformed the economy from a casino hub to a manufacturing center. Sounds rosy, right? There, the big issue is housing affordability. Why? Because you've had this huge influx of people to work in either a distribution warehouses. Walmart has a big distribution operation there, so does Amazon. Or in some of the new factories that have sprung up in, in recent years. Tesla has an enormous gigafactory, they call it, that's in the kind of mountains or near Reno. But then you have this incredible demand for housing. The building there hasn't kept up with demand, and so housing prices have gone up. Rents have gone up incredibly the cost of a mortgage has gone up. In Nevada in 2019, a household earning a median income would spend roughly 19% of their income on a mortgage for a median house. By last year, that had risen to 36% of their income. It had almost doubled. Three years post-pandemic, we're still seeing a tremendous number of families, people who are working, working maybe more than one or two jobs, and they just cannot make ends meet. Marie Baxter runs Catholic Charities, which provides services to people living in poverty in northern Nevada. In our crisis intervention services, we see a hundred people a day on walk-ins, and their stories are very similar. Literally, you know, within 30 days, my rent has doubled, or I've lost my job. So you may have an economic boom going on in terms of employment, in terms of population. What's happening in Washoe County is the literal inverse of what is happening in a place like Erie County. But it comes with very different economic costs that people really feel. 
All this could have major consequences for Democrats who are trying to convince swing state voters that their policies have been good for the economy. In the latest Bloomberg News Morning Consult poll, we asked swing state voters to name the single most important issue driving their vote, and the economy came out on top. But just how is that influencing who they plan to vote for come November? That's after the break. We had 14 children, and from the mid-70s to now, the economy is like night and day. Curtis Jones Sr. is a pastor who's lived in Erie, Pennsylvania since he was a kid and raised his family there. When we were younger, you know, my parents have 14 children. So you got to make some stuff spread out. That's one of Curtis's kids, Curtis Jones Jr. Eggs and rice was easy, inexpensive. <laughs> but when you've got, man, eggs at $5 a dozen, that's not making it spread out. Curtis Jones Jr. got involved in local area politics in 2005. He was elected to the city council, running as a Democrat. Many members of our family voted for the first time when I was running for school board and, and city council because there was a disconnect with the electoral politics and government and elected officials with the average citizen who often didn't feel like elected officials heard their voices, could meet their needs today. Like we're seeing a lot of that still with low voter turnouts. You know, what's my option? Is the devil or Satan who I'm going to vote for? Like people say things like that. Curtis Jr. works on Erie's Regional Chamber of Commerce now. And he says national politicians haven't been speaking to the issues his community faces on the ground, even when they throw money at them. We see projects, we see economic development happening, but don't always say, oh, that's because of the Biden administration or it's because of the governor. Like most people aren't thinking that way. The average person is struggling. It's an interesting dichotomy, almost like the tale of two cities, right? So you've got funding for business development economic development projects in our downtown. But we're also seeing, regrettably, an increased number of unhoused and underhoused in our community. Individual households are struggling significantly because of the cost increases. The other thing that you hear is, well, things were better not that long ago. People look back five years ago, and who was in the office at that time? And that's Donald Trump. And they say, well, look, you know, love him or hate him. Life was easier at that time. There are lots of different things that voters take into consideration, but the economy is the kind of context that doesn't go away. When we polled swing state voters on who they trusted more to handle the economy, 50% said Trump, 42% said Harris. That's higher than the 37% who said they trusted Joe Biden last month, but still a noticeable gap. Consistently, Donald Trump gets better ratings on the economy. And a lot of that has to do with this grind that people are feeling. And that's the disconnect between the national numbers that look great. But when you dig down and you get to the local level, that's where things really change, whether it's in Erie County or in Washoe County. And people are feeling grumpy for that reason. And not all that much can change between now and November, even if the Fed does cut interest rates this fall. The way this flows through the economy is it, it takes time. By the time you get to September, that's probably too late to have a real impact on this rate. And, and I think also people have kind of enduring memories, right? I mean, it's people know what they're living. And there's a lot that Joe Biden and the Democrats have done in terms of industrial policy. And there's been an incredible boom in investment in new factories. The problem is that those new factories haven't been built yet. They're being built right now. And so the hiring in those places hasn't really happened. The big manufacturing jobs boom that you would expect to come at some point hasn't come yet. And whoever is in the White House come next year, 2025, 2026, 27, is likely to benefit from that investment that is happening now. That's good for the U.S. economy. It may not be good for the Democratic Party. That's something Harris will be up against as she shapes her economic message. Because for people in places like Erie County, the economic figures that the Biden administration and now the Harris campaign are touting can sometimes feel like false advertising. My wife and I were talking about something that happened yesterday. Pastor Curtis Jones Sr. again. She asked me to go get her a, a sub sandwich, a bacon combination style submarine sandwich. So I went and got it and she walked into the room and said, you know, 
I asked for bacon and they put bacon bits on it. It made me laugh to the point where like, is this what the economy has come to? We're not actually putting slices of bacon. We're putting bacon bits on the subs. We sort of laughed at it. And then, but we said, you know, it's really sort of sad. I think that's pretty much where our economy is now. As far as we're asking for one thing, looking for something and expecting it. And ultimately we're getting bits and pieces. That's a mic drop right there, Dad. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Big Take DC podcast from Bloomberg News. I'm Saleya Mosin. This episode was produced by Julia Press. It was mixed by Blake Maples. It was edited by Aaron Edwards and Sarah Halsack. It was fact-checked by Alex Segura. A special thanks to Wendy Benjaminson, who interviewed Sean for this episode and provides editorial direction for the show with Elizabeth Ponzo. Naomi Shaven and Kim Gittleson are our senior producers. Nicole Beamsterboer is our executive producer. Sage Bauman is Bloomberg's head of podcasts. Please follow and review The Big Take DC wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps new listeners find the show. 